Good morning, everybody. The biggest challenge is always not falling over when I get onto the stage, but then, of course, I have to drop every possible piece of my entire plan here. So now we're ready. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Good morning. <laughs> That's right. We should have a follow the bouncing ball. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Danielle Pletka. I'm the Senior Vice President for Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm really delighted to co-host this morning with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and my very old, I hate to say that because it means I'm also very old, friend Evo Dalder, Ambassador Evo Dalder, um, the release of America Engaged. Wait, I have a prop. America Engaged, American Public Opinion and U.S. Foreign Policy. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a fascinating look at, uh, at American views on global engagement, on, on international issues, on American involvement in the world, and on some of the headline issues um, uh, like trade that, um, that have been so much part uh, of the public conversation that isn't about the Supreme Court. Um, I'm going to keep my... It's true. Uh, I'm going to keep my intro short and sweet uh, because we've got a, a, a lot to talk about uh, here, and we have a short video to show you as well, if I figure out how to press the green button, um, that will summarize some of the conclusions from this. A at that point, we'll turn to uh, a conversation with the panel and uh, then open it up to questions from the audience, which we're all very much looking forward to. Okay, here's the giant green button. Wait, do I point it at something? Will it work? No, it doesn't magically work unless I point it. Yes, it did. Thank you. The Trump administration has made bold attempts to reshape U.S. foreign policy. Is the American public on board? President Trump touts unilateralist policies, yet 7 in 10 Americans support the U.S. taking an active part in world affairs. And a striking majority say it is more effective for the U.S. to work with allies and other countries to achieve foreign policy goals. The president has strained relations with U.S. allies in Europe and Asia, and Americans are worried about those relationships. 57% say the U.S. has lost allies over the last year. The public still supports the transatlantic alliance. More Americans than ever favor increasing U.S. commitment to NATO. And Americans increasingly want to double down on relations with South Korea and Japan. The administration pulled out of the Iran deal and Paris Agreement. Meanwhile, majorities of the public say the U.S. should participate in both. And in fact, support has increased over the past year. The White House has opened up trade battles on multiple fronts, while the American public is more positive about the benefits of trade than ever before, saying that trade is good for the U.S. economy, consumers, and job creation. What else is the public thinking about President Trump's vision of the U.S. and its role in the world? To find out, explore the report at thechicagocouncil.org slash survey. Terrific. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel, but first, what I what I would uh, like to do is introduce Evo Dalder, who is the president of the Chicago Council. Um, former, I, I'm not going to go through your list of uh, exalted uh, resume, which is so impressive, but which is available to everybody online. Um, and uh, after you talk a little bit about uh, about this and some exciting new developments at the Chicago Council, I'll introduce the rest of the panel, and we can jump right into it. But thank you, Evo. Great. Go ahead. Well, Danny, thanks for so much, and I'm really uh, uh, delighted to be able to do this here at AAI uh, and to work together with uh, AAI to launch the, uh, the report, our annual survey. We've been doing the survey since 1974, uh, so it's been quite a while, and we probably have the best longitudinal data set on American <coughs> public attitudes on foreign policy that is around there, so we can actually make comparison not only from yet, from what happened last year, the year before, but all the way back to uh, the mid-1970s. Uh, we're very pleased to be able uh, to uh, launch this report, to make it an annual survey, which we've done for the last four years, uh, and we'll continue to do now that uh, through a very generous gift of the Crown family. Uh, we have uh, been able to create the Lester Crown Center uh, on U.S. Foreign Policy, and the survey, which is the central uh, product of that center, uh, will uh, be supported because of that general script. And this is our first public event 
uh, as the uh, Lester Crown, as part of the Lester Crown Center on U.S. Foreign Policy. So I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to note that and to, uh, to thank uh, the Crown family for their support. Uh, Lester Crown, a longtime uh, important figure in Chicago, uh, as well as in many other places, has been a, a, a huge supporter uh, <coughs> of uh, not only the council, but of this survey in particular. So we're, uh, we're pleased to be able to do that. And look forward to the conversation. Terrific. Thank you. Yes, we uh, at AEI, also a 501c3, ardently support the idea that people should support the kind of work that we all do, hint, hint, everybody. Uh, let, me, let me introduce uh, uh, everybody, although I'm, I'm sure most of these faces are well known to our audience. Carlin Bowman is a senior fellow uh, at the American Enterprise Institute. She is, I would call her an eminence grise, but perhaps an eminence brunette, uh, rouge, uh, on, on questions of polling. She is the person who everybody at AEI and, frankly, everybody in Washington turns to when they want a, a balanced understanding of all of these kinds kinds of questions on not just American public opinion, but international opinion and politics. Um, Evo, obviously, uh, has been introduced, the president of the Chicago Council. Next to Evo is Dina Smeltz. She's a senior fellow uh, of public opinion and foreign policy at the Chicago Council, and she also oversees this uh, report, which is really a tour de force. So, uh, too much French this morning, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> But still, a tour de force, really uh, an incredible resource to so many people uh, and, uh, and an important, uh, and an important uh, uh, window into American thinking. Uh, and to my right is Colin Duak, who is a Jean Kirkpatrick visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, professor at George Washington, I'm sorry, George Mason, and, uh, and uh, the author of a forthcoming book on, uh, on Republicans and foreign policy, which I know I'm eagerly awaiting partly because it doesn't seem like uh, Donald Trump won the election when I looked at this. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear what you think the reason for so much of the, these views, so many of these views which seem to fly in the face of everything that Donald Trump says and seems to stand for. Um, so uh, completely, uh, completely curious. Eva, maybe you want to just take a quick word and then Dina uh, just talk about, you know, talk about some of the surprises that you saw in here, um, especially the one thing that I'm always curious about is um, is the changes from past years. Whether you see any anything of Donald Trump in, in here at all. So, uh, thanks, Denny. Again, uh, I, I think there's sort of two two parts to the explanation of why we are seeing a very strong shift uh, in, on issues like free trade and alliances multilateralism and diplomacy away from where the president has pursued his foreign policy over the past 18 months. One is uh, that public opinion uh, polls don't measure intensity. And it is, there's no doubt uh, that the Trump base has a very intense uh, uh, view on a whole series of issues. That doesn't mean that a majority of the country necessarily moves in this direction, but those who agree with him, whether it's on trade or the fact that the allies aren't doing enough or that we ought to uh, stand up for America and, and, uh, and uh, do so with an intensity that perhaps doesn't get conveyed in the, in the opinion polls. The second reason, however, is, is perhaps uh, uh, and you know, you're imputing motives in public opinion data, so uh, it's always perhaps, um, is the idea that uh, you, don't miss, you, know, you don't notice oxygen until you miss it. Uh, and in the sense that the Trump foreign policy has, in very fundamental ways, tried to go at core pillars of American foreign policy, opening markets, strengthening alliances, supporting freedom and democracy around the world, uh, people have come to realize that maybe free trade, strong alliances, supporting freedom and democracy around the world is a good thing. Uh, uh, you, they may not have supported it in the same way because it wasn't, it wasn't as much under, under challenge. And the challenge, frankly, is not, is not just under Donald Trump. It's a longer-term challenge that has emerged in American foreign policy, belief uh, that the Americans uh, actually wanted to retreat from the world. Uh, and therefore, let's pursue policies of retreat. And Americans say, well, actually, maybe that wasn't the best thing that came out of there. And uh, we actually liked it the way it was. Uh, uh, and uh, just like you don't notice oxygen until it's no longer there, um, they're noticing that what we call the rules-based order, or whatever you want to call it, actually matters to them uh, and has a benefit. 
What's striking to me, Dina, is, is um, looking especially at the really interesting section in the back where you go down a series of questions and you divide things up, not just by the, the, you know, the overall numbers, but by Republicans, independents, and Democrats, mm -hmm. um, is, is, you know, is, is the, the uh, stark difference on certain, on certain issues. Uh, and yet, you know, we talk about trade, but of course, the constituency for free trade is, is, is diminished not just in the Republican Party, not just in the Trump base, but, I mean, Hillary Clinton, <coughs> who also didn't support the, the TPP and who supported NAFTA, but only kind of reluctantly, despite the fact that it was a signature, a signature part of her own husband's um, administration. Similarly, you know, uh, under Obama, interest in Russia was you know, not really there. And um, democracy was viewed as you know, George Bush's feckless neocon efforts. And now suddenly I see support for you know, promoting democracy in the 70s for Democrats. And it's sort of like, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Um, and I would love to hear your analysis. And throw in anything else. Use my question to say whatever you want. OK, I will. <laughs> That's um, a Washington tradition. <laughs> um, so I think. But just to echo what Eva said, I think Americans, for to some degree, took some of the traditional foreign policy stances and position we had for granted. And one um, side effect of Trump's tweeting, perhaps, is that more Americans are actually paying attention to some of these things and perhaps Googling what is NATO, who are our allies. Um, we definitely see that on the Democratic constituency side, that opinion and um, interest in foreign policy, U.S. relations with other countries has gone up significantly since the past year. So I think some of it is Republican, um, Republicans um, who do not agree necessarily with President Trump's view that our allies are not important or that uh, NATO, that think that NATO should be supported, and Democrats reinforcing their views on positive views of trade, on uh, the importance of our alliances, the importance of even defending our allies if they're under attack. So I think just the general situation um, has made people more aware and react more strongly in some ways. But one thing I wanted to mention was that, yeah, we didn't, in this particular report this year, we focused mostly on overall opinion of the United States because we wanted to do track, see how much traction President Trump's views had. And we really see that among Trump supporters, they are still very strongly attached to some of Trump's views. But, um, but the rest of the public is not moving that way. Still, there are some partisan differences, especially on some issues that are not necessarily fully covered in here, which is on immigration, where there's huge differences between Republicans and Democrats. On climate change, there's a big difference as well. And on trade, I think Republicans and Democrats, they're both positive, but they come at it at different angles. So some Republicans may feel like we see the benefits of trade now. Republicans and Democrats are the same on that. But some Republicans might think, well, that's because there's a Republican president in power. Trump is going to make things better. Um, he might improve trade agreements more to our liking. And so there's a convergence between Democrats and Republicans on that issue. Interesting. Um, and you mentioned the president's Twitter. I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot uh, uh, here at AEI um, is, you know, in an effort to be, uh, I think, fair to the president, much as, you know, our, our, our aim is not to support any party or, 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 or side, but to support good policy. Um, but one of the interesting things we talk about is the divergence, of, divergence, but, divergence between the president's um, rhetorical persona and policies and the actual policies pursued by the administration without getting into the who, what, why, or when talk show style about why that is. It seems to me that when you talk about these views, people are paying much more attention to what's being said than what's being done. You know, we haven't pulled out of NATO. We've put more sanctions on Russia than, um, than the previous administration. Um, uh, you know, we could go on and on about the, the vast gulf between the president's rhetoric and his administration's policies. Um, uh, what are people seeing in your view? Uh, I, I actually want Dina to ask it, but, I'm, but 
Anyone else jump in, please? Uh, I, I don't mean so to be So foreign this. policy is not um, a natural space for the average American to get too involved in. So um, yes, I think in terms of, it depends what news you follow. You know, it's no secret that we tend, Americans and people around the world tend to look for news that generally reinforces what they already think. So I think, um, Basically, people are reacting more toward the tweets, toward what's in a headline, toward what their particular anchor or newspaper journalist is saying, um, more than what's actually being done. Yeah. Interesting. Carlin, um, yes. you've been looking at this for ages. Uh, what, I mean, what's your read on the overall message and how we should, what should we be taking from this? Well, first of all, I'm an enormous fan of this survey. I've watched it for many, many years. and. Uh, most of the polling business these days is about celebrity or crisis, and to see questions that are asked year after year with identical wording is just something we don't get from a lot of public opinion pollsters anymore. So I'm really a, a great fan of this survey. That said, I'd like to push back on a couple of things that I think uh, that I see in the report overall. First of all, I agree with both Ivo and Dina that the public is often a counterweight to prevailing opinion. You saw this on Obamacare when, during the Obama administration, Americans were worried that he was going too far, so people opposed the bill. Now people favor Obamacare because people are worried that the Trump administration is going too far. So the public acts as a counterweight many times. And also, Americans are just generally inattentive to foreign affairs. I mean, I'm not going to go home tonight and read the Paris Accords. I'm going to do other things with my evening. So I, I agree on those two broad thrusts. But I also think that we shouldn't rely on a single question uh, about any point in public opinion. And I'd like to look at the, the very first slide you showed or the very first part of the presentation, which was that very famous question about whether it's better for us to play an active role or whether it's better for us to stay out. That question, I think, goes back even before your poll to 1947, the mm -hmm. National Opinion Research Center asked that question very early on. And I don't agree with the findings, and I don't agree with the findings that have gone up since, the, since Trump has come to town. But let's look at another question that Pew asks, a very similar question on the subject. And here's the way they ask it. Is it better for the United States to play an active role in foreign affairs, or should we pay less attention to problems overseas and concentrate more on problems here at home? That question also has a long history. The last time Pew asked it, there's not, a, there's not a, a, a asking from this year, but the public split evenly. So I would argue about that first question, that Americans are internationalists, but very reluctant about their internationalism. And that's been true for a very long time. And I also think there's a lot of polling evidence that suggests that we're tired of bearing a lot of burdens alone. And you see that in some of the rhetoric Trump used during the campaign. And I think that's, that's just a very important point, never to rely on a single question, but to try to get a sense of where public opinion is. And I think both things are true. We're internationalists, and we're tired of paying for a lot of these burdens and those things, too. So that's my first reaction. Second point about the poll about the trade questions. Um, I don't know whether you included in this, in this new poll uh, this job security for workers, mm -hmm. where you've always shown a much lower mm -hmm. level of support um, than, than the three questions that you showed, which showed an uptick in support for trade. Pew came out with a poll yesterday that also showed an uptick in support for trade. But their headline was quite different. They said, Americans, like many other advanced economies, are not convinced of the benefits of free trade. So again, you get a sense of the complexity of opinion on a lot of these questions overall. So while I generally agree with the thrust, I think that there are other things that we need to consider. Yeah, just a, a few points. Um, so yes, I agree with the point you did make that I think you can support engaged leadership in the world, yeah. but also not want to carry the full burden ourselves. And I, we don't really just base um, our conclusion on the one question. We also have a question about whether the United States should have a shared leadership role, the dominant leadership role, or no leadership role. Very few, less than 10%, say no leadership role. The majority say a shared leadership role. Um, we have another question in this year's survey and found that 91% of Americans say that we can achieve our foreign policy best when we work with other countries, not alone. So it's a series of, of which also means shared, not just uh, having the singular burden. And on trade, <clears throat> the Pew question, 
they ask it a little bit differently. They have um, an additional response rate, uh, response option that says um, it's, it's a neutral option. And so a lot of people take that neutral option. But when we look at our data compared to the Pew data, the direction is both positive yeah. on trade and for us, even on the creation of jobs um, question. And yeah. so we focus on the fact that trade is, uh, support for trade is increasing among both Republicans and Democrats at the same time now. So that's really the takeaway um, for us. Yeah. Again, I'd also push back a little on the shared leadership role. Again, that's something that I think Americans have always supported. We've always wanted to work with our allies where that is possible. But a lot of questions in this report, and I'm, as I say, I'm a fan of this report and this survey. Um, they're, asked, they're asked about abstractions in terms of work and hypotheticals. And those are notoriously unreliable in public opinion. Well, I'm sure it's heartening for some to see the increase in support for using military force in a couple of very dangerous situations. Those are hypotheticals, and I'm not so sure, after, particularly after our experience in Iraq, that Americans are willing to give their presidents that kind of latitude in foreign affairs. But I'd actually opposite, uh, argue the opposite, yeah. just that yeah. if it's a hypothetical and already 64% of Americans say they would support um, defending South Korea if it's attacked by North Korea. And if we really were to do that, the president would then give cues from the bully pulpit, and so would the whole foreign policy, you know, his cabinet behind it. So then, in fact, you would think there'd be even more of a rallying effect. So that's what I would well, argue. Did you want to say something? No, I, I mean, I would make the point that I think what, the, what numbers like this tell you is that there is an enabling coalition in the American public that allows leaders to, to lead. And so, the, the, particularly on issues like alliances, if your numbers are that you start off uh, with only a third behind you when it comes to defending the Baltic states against a Russian attack or Japan against a, a North Korean attack, it becomes more difficult to rally the public to that, uh, to that perspective if you want it. So it's about the enabling of leadership. And so I'd, I'd make two points. One is that the more Trump has gone one way, the more the public has gone the other way. And whether that's true on trade and, and on alliances and a whole series of issues doesn't tell you exactly how they are in particular issues. But secondly, it's this, and it, it means that if you have leaders who want to lead, who want to take the American public in a particular direction, they now have an enabling coalition uh, that tells you it's true on trade, it's true on uh, on dealing with other countries. It's certainly true on alliances, uh, which, uh, as Danny rightly said, the administration has been a very strong proponent of strong alliances led by no, none other than the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and, and the commitment, for example, the physical commitment to NATO has increased significantly over the past two years. Uh, and maybe it is that the American public is appreciating that. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that Commander-in-Chief hasn't uh, shared that uh, commitment in his own rhetoric, uh, and, and there may be a reaction to that as well. Uh, of course, this is this is uh, in some ways reflective of the of the growing. This is not a word. Partisanization. I'm not even going to say it because it's not a word. Um, the the relegation of absolutely everything to partisan yeah. politics. I remember the story about uh, about In and Out Burger suddenly supporting something uh, conservative, <laughs> and there being therefore a leftist organized boycott of In and Out Burger. You know, hamburgers are pretty, I think, bipartisan unless you're a vegetarian. <laughs> um, so uh, let, I want to ask, uh, I want to get Colin to jump into this. It's funny because I look at I look at this uh, survey and I think you know n equals one and one is me. These represent, I represent the majority views, you know, internationalist, pro-trade, pro-engagement, absolutely defend our allies, go to war for principle, stand up for democracy. I love this stuff. Um, but I, I, I do wonder, you know, I, I, I do wonder how we, how we um, uh, understand some of the, the nuance behind it. It's, you know, a little bit like all of us on, on, you know, the morning after election day in 2016 when we were, you know, you read something like this and then you were kind of shocked to see, gee, how did Donald Trump get elected? And it, partly it's, of course, nobody cares about foreign policy, although they should. And, uh, and partly that, that we are the elites uh, of whom he speaks. So, Colin, just talk a little bit about, about the, the, the politics and the issues. And I just want to say I do like a good cheeseburger. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's bipartisan. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so, right, I mean, and I, it's, it's a very useful survey, but I do share some of Carlin's uh, skepticism. For example, I noticed in the video to begin with the way it was framed, unlike in the, in the survey, was that it's a given that what Trump wants is to stay out, whereas 70% of the American public says active part, therefore it's the public now versus Trump. I, I don't think that's how Trump supporters see it. I think well, the reason a lot of them would say yes to active part is that they think that's what he's doing. I mean, there's differences among Americans as to how to be active. So Trump supporters, right, that percentage of Republicans who support his foreign policy, which is a great many, actually, would say he is being active. He's being active in emphasizing new trade deals, emphasizing allied burden sharing, pushing back on ISIS and on terrorism, pushing back on China, right down the list. I mean, people are, a lot of Republicans are very happy with Trump's foreign policy, and they think he's active. So that doesn't really tell us much other than that Trump Republicans disagree with the liberal internationalist worldview, <laughs> which we already knew. So uh, I think you have to be a little more granular about what, what exact form of activism we favor. And there's more than one version among Democrats and Republicans. Um, just on the Democratic side, I mean, I, I am struck by the debate, sort of center left and further left, over foreign policy. There seems to be a lot of division when you get down to it over military intervention, free trade, you know, you name it. There's an interesting debate going on among progressives, and we'll have to see in reality heading into 2020 what kind of foreign policy Democrats can actually rally around. Is it going to be kind of a muscular Clinton internationalism, or, or is it going to be something closer to a Bernie Sanders? I think that's an open question. So we don't really know that from the survey, as useful as it is. We, we, we know that Democrats don't like Trump. We already knew that. We know that if Trump says the sky is blue, we're likely to hear that it's not. So what I'd like to hear is, what exactly is the alternative, right? We're, we're going to have an interesting debate heading into 2020. So this, this really actually is an, an interesting question. Uh, you know, if, you, if, we, if we dive into this question of politics, and, uh, you know, well, if Trump wants it, it's probably bad. Um, and I, I could see that even on some of the motherhood and apple pie questions, uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's anti-Trumpism that drives a lot of the seeming principle behind some of people's foreign policy views. So what what happens? Okay, let's 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 forget that there's a big split among Republicans and that there is this deep divide, frankly, between internationalists on the left and the right and um, more isolationist powers on the left and the right. And let's talk a little bit about uh, about what you saw among uh, Democratic uh, respondents. Um, you know, you 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 were deeply immersed in this, Tina. What what inferences did you draw? I can tell you, sitting from the vantage point here in DuPont Circle, I um, find my democratic internationalist friends very worried about what their answers are going to be and, and not encouraged in the way that I feel encouraged by seeing some of these responses. How do you see it? Um, so one point I'd like to make is foreign policy used to be a very bipartisan issue among the public as well. It wasn't really until 2003 where we saw, among the public, where we saw large differences between Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy issues. That's when they started with the So the Reagan war. administration never happened? Well, no, I'm talking about, we, <laughs> I'm talking about in public opinion and on our long-term trends that when we asked um, Republicans and Democrats about immigration, they had exactly the same views, pretty much. Um, Two-thirds of Americans, whether you were Republican or Democrat in the 90s, were concerned about immigration. Now there's a huge difference with uh, Republicans staying the same, but Democrats really not very concerned at all about immigration today. So I'm just saying, that over time, in the public opinion surveys, questions that we have asked, there's been much more of a split. Um, and I think what's, so some of those widening differences are new. But at the same time, I think what activates Republicans versus Democrats on foreign policy has not changed that much, which is that Republicans look more toward using our superior military power as a way to project our image and power influence abroad where Democrats just kind of naturally fall more into the multilateralism, um, soft power types of ways of projecting our influence. So I, I think that's just the fundamental difference in the way 
people view foreign policy? You know, I think there's a, I think there's a debate going on in part because the, there's a Republican president within the Republican Party that is a little easier uh, to view than the debate that's going on on the, on the Democratic side, in part also because the, Demo the, the Republican national security establishment showed in 2016 that it wasn't standing with its candidates. So you have this tension. Uh, it is easier to measure, and you see, you see the continuation of it. Uh, I, I totally agree with Colin that there's a tension in the Democratic Party about how and whether to engage in the world. Uh, and, and that these, uh, th these, these uh, numbers don't, don't reflect that tension, and it's, it's likely to be playing part in what's going to happen in 19 and 20 within the Democratic Party. What I would argue to any Democratic nominee, as I would, frankly, to anybody thinking about running on the Republican uh, side, is there is a large centrist majority for a traditional um, internationalist American foreign policy. Uh, and on, on issues like trade and security alliances and democracy and freedom and working in international institutions, you don't have to walk away from that policy in order to not only win an, a national election, but even within your own party. And that, I, I, by the way, I think that's true on the Republican side, and it's true on, on the Democratic side. Uh, and so public opinion don't, surveys don't tell you what to do. Uh, they tell you what's possible you may, or, or, or what, what avenues may be open for you. And the idea, which we saw in 2016, that the American public would not support TPP or NAFTA or free trade, turns out not to be true. If you make the argument and show why it matters, you can actually uh, either neutralize that sentiment or actually build upon it. And I think that's what the opinion poll shows. There is a basis for an internationalist foreign policy. You don't have to uh, embrace it, but if you do, there's a reason to believe that others are going to be with you on that. Right. Carlin made this, has made this point repeatedly over the years, which is that, that, um, that, that even polls are highly responsive to uh, the president's leadership yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and that you know, if the president stands up every week and says Iran is going to nuke us, Iran is a terrorist state, yeah, people are going to be more hepped up about Iran just naturally. Um, By the way, it, we see that on North Korea. So uh, right. the, 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 the concern about North Korea's nuclear <coughs> weapons has increased tremendously last year, and it continues to be very high this year. Oh, although, in part, well, the I'd rhetoric put, is changing, so we'll see how that goes. I'll uh, put money on the fact that, on, uh, uh, on the notion, let's put it that way, that if you say uh, North Korea has 100,000 missiles pointing at South Korea, and the only thing standing between them is 27,000 American troops, um, should we engage in a conflict with, uh, with North Korea to stop it from having nuclear weapons, no matter what it takes? we get way different numbers, which of course is unfortunately some of the reality of the situation. But I actually wanted to press you about the, the intensity issue that you, uh, that you uh, raised at the beginning, because I think that's hugely important. Um, so here's the, here are the facts, right? Crying out for a leader. Uh, John McCain died a few weeks ago. Uh, he was, in many ways, for Republicans, this, this guy, this guy who took this poll and stood for these kind of principles that people seem to stand for. I think in many ways Joe Biden, perhaps with some nuances, is, is that guy too. Um, intensity about John McCain, one of the things I noticed after he died is, wow, a lot of intensity about hating John McCain on the right and on the left. Um, Joe Biden, people aren't that excited. They are much more intense about the other guy. Why is there, and I'd love to hear any of you on this, why is there this huge gap? This feels like a commercial ready to be made to help elect some good person who I would feel good about no matter what party they came from. Where, where the hell is that person? <laughs> I mean, foreign policy just isn't that important in elections. Uh, uh, and and uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll leave it over to the expert, but the reality is very few circumstances uh, do people win on the, case, on the basis of foreign policy. That was even true during the Cold War. Uh, it's particularly been true in the, in, in, uh, uh, since then. Remember, the last four presidents uh, elected to office ran on doing less rather than doing more in international affairs, in part because, and this is the Pew survey, uh, the, they, they framed it as we, if we do less abroad, we can do more at home. I actually believe you can do more abroad and more at home. Uh, so I, don't, I think it's a false choice. But if you want to frame it in that term, you can. 
Uh, but doing more at home is what more, most Americans care about. They mm -hmm. care about health care. They care about their economy. They care about education. They care about uh, whether the markets is working uh, and, and, and whether there is uh, freedom uh, in, in, in their societies. And that's more important. That's why they vote for presidents and congressmen and senators and state legislators and God knows, even mayors, um, uh, because that matters to them in their daily lives. So. One reason that a Joe Biden or a, a John McCain doesn't bring in a in an overall political uh, setting, although you know I'm not saying that John that Joe Biden wouldn't necessarily in 2020, uh, uh, is because their foreign yeah. policy view isn't what is going to be the difference. It's their views on domestic policy. And I don't even know if it, if domestic policies is as strong as the partisanification of um, the United States. Um, just, you know, a lot of Republicans did not want Donald Trump to win the nomination, yet nine in 10 Republicans voted for him. Um, it happens with the Democrats, too. And I think when, if you're talking about who's going to be the leader, partisan affiliation seems to win out um, when people go to vote on election day. So, Carlin, you, you, uh, when I emailed you uh, uh, and we talked about this, you did, you said exactly what you said on the stage, which is, you know, this is this is a poll that you really uh, look to uh, with with uh, eagerness and, and huge respect, um, and uh, you have that that sense of the trend as well. I mean, what what surprises you here? You know, again, we can pull out the individual uh, details that fly in the face of some of the things we're up to, whether they're on trade or, or South Korea, Paris Accords, Iran, yada, yada. Um, what jumps out at you? Well, I, I guess as I look at a survey like this that's, that's so valuable for the trends that we have, um, the stability of a lot of trends, I think, is rather important, even though we've seen an uptick as a counterweight to Donald Trump on a lot of these questions. In the new survey, um, the stability of opinion in foreign policy, I think, is, is very impressive, and you've documented that better than, better than, better than anyone, I think. And and so you know the the the, the sparkly object of the moment uh, is is really very transient uh, from year year on year. Let's put it that way, rather than the minute on minute that we seem to live. I think so. I look at the trends over time. I think that's more important. I mean, today the sparkly object is Kavanaugh. I mean, I don't know where opinion is going to come down on Kavanaugh overall, but it's just it's just crowding out everything else in the polling world, and that's a shame because this is the kind of thing that should get more attention. I have a sparkly object. Oh, I'd give like us, to talk give about. us yes. um, page twenty-one on in the report is the opinion on trade. So it's, I think it's pretty amazing how. Right now, both Democrats and Republican views of trade have reached an all-time high, especially the question that you brought up, Carlin, earlier yes. about creating jobs. Yeah. yeah. So this is, for the longest time, only about a third of Americans thought that trade would have a positive benefit on creating jobs. And now it's 67% overall of Americans think that. I think this is a probably special point in time where People are reacting against the trade bashing, which is a positive in my view. Um, but also, it's a like I said earlier, it's a mixture of Democrats feeling like uh, they want to really reinforce that trade is good. It's for me, when I first started working on public opinion in the U.S., I was really surprised to find that Democrats are the ones that are the more pro-trade, pro-globalization constituency, which seems upside down a little bit. But nevertheless, that's what it has grown into, the pro-trade um, constituency. But the fact that now a Republican is in the White House has also made Republicans really positive on trade. So that was a, a, one of the really bright, shiny pieces for me. The other is the Iran agreement. It's interesting. Even a majority of Republicans in this survey now support the Iran agreement. Yeah. Can I push back a little on Iran and that question yeah. that you've asked overall? Um, interesting question, just like your question on the Paris Climate Accords. I think if I worded that very differently, I could have gotten a, a very different response. Question wording is so integral to these polls overall. I mean, Americans think Iran, the leaders of Iran are thugs. They um, have just enormous doubts about Iran. We always want to sit down and talk with our enemies. As I said, that was true throughout the entire Cold War, so that's the answer you always get on questions like that. But to say that they are not just deeply skeptical about Iran and its leaders, it, I think, would be slightly wrongheaded. 
Yeah, I, I, I uh, just as someone who pays a lot of attention to the Middle East, I, I agree. I think your question uh, uh, made the Iran agreement a little bit uh, more. Uh, it, it weighed the it weighed the positive uh, uh, more than the negative. Um, you know, would you want an Iran, Iran agreement that enabled Iran to have to keep uh, to keep uh, producing fissile material and in and in ten to thirteen years have no constraints on its nuclear program? Uh, no, that's a bad agreement. You know, I, I, so I mean, I do think it's important. Uh, although, again, it is very fair to 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 say that Americans' level of knowledge about this is is. Is, is very, you know, is, is very low. As Carlin said, you know, we don't go home with a copy of the JCPOA, and I, well, I do, but most normal <laughs> people don't go home with a copy of the JCPOA. But nevertheless, just the sense that Americans support uh, some kind of inner, you know, talking to Iran yeah, to come right. to some agreement, and the fact that it was such a big part of the 2016 presidential election and slamming the Iran agreement, the fact that there's a majority that still support it, I think is just, it, it goes to the steady, stable uh, trends that we've seen over time, that Americans do want to engage in the world and they do want to try to work with other countries. Right. No, and that's a very important. That's a very important lesson. So, Colin, um, just to, to come back to to come back to sort of the steady versus the day to day, and the um, establishment versus um, the intense anti-establishment. What uh, you know, what jumps out at you? What are the and 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 the one thing we haven't talked about here, which again I think is is awesome, is um, is the inclusion of independence. Seeing where you know where they are, what absolutely tickled me was um, how many of them are right between the Republicans and the Democrats splitting the difference um, because of course we think of them as you know as, as the big swing uh, Colin sure thank you um, what jumped out at me actually was the appendix not to sound like too much of a wonk but there really is a bipartisan agreement among the public in both parties on preventing the spread of nuclear weapons combating terrorism uh, keeping a close eye on North Korea so that's encouraging, right? Um, there really are deep differences also, as you pointed out, bet between the two parties on issues like illegal immigration. Uh, that's a, that, for Republicans, is now a priority. It is not for Democrats. And then on the other side, you know, you find similar issues on climate change, let's say. So there really are differences. Um, but I actually think Evo made a great point, and I, that's a, that is one takeaway from this report, which is there is space politically if candidates, or for that matter, if and when the current president wants to emphasize support for U.S. allies, there's nothing to stop him from doing it politically. He can do it. And, and as a matter of fact, he often does. <laughs> and the administration often does. Sometimes Trump regularly off the cuff questions it. And this is, what, this is what's infamous. But um, there is space politically for any president, including the current one, to support uh, free trade agreements, U.S. allies, active U.S. role in the world. He doesn't just have to love Kim Jong Un. He can he can love, you know, our actual allies. So it's your turn. Um, if everybody would follow AEI, simple rules and few. Uh, raise your hand. Wait for me to call on you. Wait for a mic. Identify yourself and your affiliation, and put your brilliant and lengthy statement in the form of a brief question. Go. This gentleman back here. Oh, you hold it? Thank yeah. you very much. My name is Yaya Fanusi with the United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. I woke up early this morning because anytime you talk about America global leadership, I want to uh, see what you always say. And as I look at you all at the, um, up there, and I look at the majority here, it always pondered me, I'm 75 years old, since the Second World War. Who gave, where did America organize a global referendum in which the majority of the people who don't look like you guys and up here said, yes, we want you to lead the world? That's one. Secondly, I want you to think about Trump as the Nikita Khrushchev of the capitalist system. He's dismantling globalization, he's throwing out everything that you all have hold there, this, this swamp, the establishment. Third, you need to take into consideration what are the negative effects of um, America global leadership in the world. Why you kill a lot of people, kill their leaders. Is that what you're talking about, America leading? 
Vietnam. Got it. Thank See you, ya. sir. So uh, we've got a lot here, but in fact, I, if I can just uh, pick one piece of what the gentleman um, uh, offered, that's true. This, it feels a little missing, actually. One of the things that people don't like is the backlash of American leadership, um, the presumption of American leadership, you know, the Colin Powell doctrine, uh, you know, you broke it, you own it, um, and, and uh, you know, something that Barack Obama ran with. Um, did you get any feel for this uh, in, in the questions that you were asking about America's role in the world? There actually, it's a, there's, there's another poll which is being released today, which is the Global Attitudes Pew Survey, uh, where you are seeing uh, a backlash uh, and a very strong one uh, abroad against uh, the current leadership. Uh, our, uh, our favorability ratings as a country are plummeting, uh, particularly among our allies. Uh, and the, uh, the view of the president uh, as whether, whether they, people have confidence in the United States President uh, in uh, doing the right thing in world affairs has plummeted too. It's now below not only uh, Xi Jinping, which was true last year, but Vladimir Putin, um, which is a worrisome uh, sign, and that's true even among our allies. Uh, so that's one. Uh, that's the one set of uh, public opinions. And I do think the other thing we measured, the particular one, is is it more important and more effective for the United States to be admired or to be feared to get stuff done? And overwhelmingly, Americans think it's more important to be admired in order to get stuff done, which is a little contrary uh, to the way the president has conducted his uh, foreign policy, uh, whether it is bashing the, uh, our, our enemies up north uh, uh, in order to get a trade agreement, or our enemies down south uh, in order to get a trade agreement, or indeed the foes of the European Union uh, to get a trade agreement. He has, he has used fear. Uh, bullying tactics, uh, and to some extent, according to Axios this morning, very effectively. Uh, the question is, is that the way Americans as a whole want to deal with the rest of the world? Uh, our poll suggests maybe in specific issues, but definitely not overall. It is, it is really interesting. I mean, you know, it, it, you're exactly right, of course. Everybody would prefer to be uh, uh, admired or loved rather than feared. Um, but, but it isn't ineffective. Um, even though it makes your allies, you know, grumpy, it, it gets, it's funny, it gets some stuff done. And I'm really actually excited to see next year because actually a lot of what's gotten done has been kind of recent, you know, with uh, the follow-on to NAFTA and some of the other things that uh, our European allies finally, maybe, I know NATO, was a, this was your battle, <laughs> a doubtful look, maybe, maybe putting a little more into their uh, defense obligations to, to NATO, um, you know, we all hope, um, but that will be interesting inshallah. next year to see, yes. yeah, insha inshallah is what we always have to say about, uh, about NATO. Folks, Jessica? Hi, my name is Jessica Trisco Darden, and I'm a Jean Kirkpatrick fe uh, fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. I want to ask a question that is more directed towards Carlin and Dina, but of course everyone's welcome to comment on it, and it is the demographic uh, composition of your respondents. So first of all, a lot has been pointed to about shifts in millennials' foreign policy positions and opinions, and that how this perhaps enabled the kind of leftward tug of the Democratic Party, but also that Republican or conservative-leaning millennials hold different foreign policy positions than the party has dominantly. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that within the context of, of recent survey results. Sure. Uh, well, the composition of this particular survey sample is on page 31 of the report, if you want to see that. Um, and just two points I wanted to make. Well, one of the differences between Democrats and Republicans is definitely in demographic composition, and it's been changing over time, that the Democrats are more diverse and uh, attract younger people to affiliate with it, but also younger people tend not to vote, too, so it's a trade-off. Um, and we did a really extensive study with uh, some researchers from Cato uh, and the Charles Koch Institute on the millennials last year. And the report is on our website. I'm happy to send it to you. But basically what we found out, people were assuming, I guess conventional wisdom is that the millennials want to withdraw from, they don't want to get involved in other countries' business. 
but we found actually on uh, cooperative internationalism, uh, diplomacy, on working with other countries to solve world problems, millennials are the same as other Americans, but the, the way they differ is they're not as supportive as other Americans on using military action. But that said, a majority of them still did support using US troops to fight terrorism, things like that. So the big question will be to watch them and see, is this something specific to this generation because they grew up during the Iraq war, during the Afghan war, or is it something that changes over their life cycle? Because young people in general, since we've been conducting surveys, have been less um, fearful of threats around the world and less supportive of taking military action. But there might be something particular to this generation that continues. I think Dean is absolutely right that um, if you look at the millennials, their diversity is probably their most important defining characteristics that's made them in some ways a, a global generation. As they were beginning to emerge, we called them the Benetton generation. I don't even know whether Benetton is still around anymore. But, <laughs> but, um, but in trouble. <laughs> they are. But uh, they're certainly much more accepting, much more tolerant in all of those areas involving diversity. And I think it's also making them more more of a have more of a global focus their music their pop culture everything is a global focus rather than a national focus in many ways but i think i agree with dina completely that their attitudes in some ways are pretty familiar so both the generational effects as the millennials move into a, a huge chunk of millennials are now married they're beginning to own homes and of course you always have generational effects that that affect people's attitudes too uh, can I ask you a question, because you focused me on page 31, which is so interesting. Does your racial composition reflect um, uh, voting patterns? Are there more black, Hispanic, and other non-Hispanic um, uh, voters in the Democratic Party than, than, than white, 51 to 48? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think it's just, this is the, remember, this is a general public survey, uh -huh. so we didn't, weed out those people who vote or who are even registered to vote. Uh -huh. Some of these people aren't even. They were just people with opinions. Yes. Uh, if you look forward, for example, the Democratic primary electorate will be almost 30 to 32 percent minority in the next election. That will be enormously important going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, and this, this helps get, uh, give us a window. Yes, sir. Uh, so, um, based on the survey uh, results, who, uh, who are you? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Emmanuel Johnson. I'm an emerging leader with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Um, with the survey results about the opinions on NATO, um, about not wanting, well, a few percentage points about wanting to increase the uh, commitment, and I think you said something about um, wanting to support countries like Latvia in, in the NATO alliance. Um, do you think NATO was more of just an ideal now versus an actual enforceable treaty? Because it doesn't seem like a lot of Americans would want to get involved if a conflict happened with one of our NATO allies that are not one of the major allies. Maybe Evo and Colin can handle this one. Evo, <laughs> you but, first. Uh, I mean, two, two things about NATO. One is that it's remarkably steady how support for NATO in the American public. Uh, and it's, it's at three quarters, and it's been there for the last eight years, uh, higher than actually at times during the Cold War, which is interesting. Uh, the one little tidbit of findings this is the highest number of people who think the United States needs to increase its commitment to NATO that we've ever found in the survey. It's now one in five, which is a pretty remarkable number, uh, uh, particularly given the public rhetoric. Uh, we also are finding that the highest number of Americans saying that if Russia were to attack one of our Baltic states, most which is our NATO members, uh, what is it, 60? 60% or so are now saying uh, the U.S. should use troops to defend them. Uh, that's a remarkably high number. Two years ago, it was less than a majority. Do you believe it? Yeah, I think, well, again, it means that if the president says he wants to do it, the American public will, will, can be with him. Uh, public opinion doesn't determine from American foreign policy, but it does provide an enabling, an enabling factor. It means that you don't have to run against NATO in order to win an election. You can actually run in favor of NATO uh, not that many people will, that, again, mm -hmm. uh, other than me, I don't think there's anybody who will vote uh, uh, on that <laughs> basis. Um, uh, that said, it just means you don't have to uh, have a, a foreign policy that emphasizes we don't like our allies and they need to do more and, uh, and we, want to, uh, we want to go it alone. 
uh, there, is a, there is a fundamental majority, internationalist majority, uh, out there, and it's been there for a very long time. Uh, contrary to all of the rhetoric that you find in this town and about Americans wanting to retreat from the world. They don't. Uh, they may want to do more at home. Uh, and uh, the case of politicians is to make, it, to make the argument you can do one without having to necessarily denigrate the other. Colin? Yeah, Chicago did a very useful survey last year as well where it showed that even breaking it down by Trump Republicans versus non-Trump Republicans, that Trump Republicans support NATO overwhelmingly. So, I mean, it is just not the case that, that they oppose it. Um, but I do worry about your concern. I, I guess you do too. I mean, uh, certainly you need consistent signals, for example, to Russia to make it clear that if there's any possibility of aggression in the Baltics, it's got to be hands off. I, I think the Russians understand that. We should be very clear about that. I think most of the time the administration's been clear about it. But one of the encouraging things from this survey is there's a lot of public support for it. It's really interesting, and you know what? You ask a, a question. We're talking about this survey, and 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 as if it only has an American audience, and it's very important to understand that, which you know, often people in in the U.S. government don't, is that we have a global audience, and um, and so you know when they hear, uh, you know, what the hell was it, Montenegro? Um, uh, they they worry, uh, and when they see something like this, they uh, are encouraged. I hope that one of the things that it does is encourage uh, international leaders when they come to Washington to actually show more leadership. Too often the discussion is why did you do this thing that undercut global leadership rather than actually, you know, together we must lead. That's a conversation that's that's very hard to have with a lot of foreign embassies in Washington and I think it I hope this encourages uh, those countries to, to actually come and, and welcome American leadership, because that's a great thing. Let's take one last question over there. <laughs> Brian. Good morning. I'm Brian Katulis with the Center for American Progress. I was interested in the finding on illegal immigrants and refugees uh, and the partisan gap that is quite strong there in terms of how, how important that is. I wonder if you had some comments on it. And then importantly, if there's time series on it, uh, it's not in the report right now, but I'm curious to see, is this something that's been there for a while? Um, how do you analyze this? Is this a reflection of our current leader and the dialogue on this? Or was there something there, sort of the architecture of all of this and, and where you think that's headed? Yeah, sure. Um so that is probably the largest gap that we have um, between Republicans and Democrats is on the uh, view of how much of a threat is uh, the large number of refugees and immigrants coming into the United States. 46 percent gap. Yeah, there's a 46 percentage point difference. It's one of the like top five issues of top threats for um, Republicans in it. If it's not at the bottom, it's near the bottom for Democrats. So we have seen this over time. As I mentioned earlier, um, in the early 90s or in the late 90s, when we first started asking about it, Republicans and Democrats were actually in the same place, uh, that they both were concerned about it. Over time, Democrats have become steadily less and less concerned. And part of that is due to the increased diversity within the um, Democratic Party. Uh, people who are non-white and younger are much more open to immigrants than um, older Americans and white Americans. So that's really one of the biggest shifts. Yeah, and the Republican number's been very steady. So uh, at around, yeah. you know, what is it, 60, anywhere between 60 and 70 64. points. The Democratic number uh, uh, 15 years ago was about the same, and it's now down to the low 20s or even the teens. So the, the change is in the Democrats uh, of and the consistency among Republicans. So one really important point that often gets lost is that despite that big difference between uh, whether immigration is a threat, when you ask Americans, do you support a path to citizenship for illegal immigrants or should they be deported, a majority of Americans think that they should be granted a path to citizenship, including many Republicans. So we have many reports on this, I can easily send you one. Well, what's stunning to me, I, I see there was, there's another question on control on foreign policy goals and controlling and reducing illegal immigration. And there, there's a 51 
point gap. Notwithstanding, however, Republican and Democratic administrations have done almost nothing useful, whether it's you know, what I think about building a wall, um, but dealing with the issues that are driving people to emigrate, whether it's crime in, in Honduras or, or what's going on in Venezuela or any of these issues, is, is an absolute bottom of the barrel. If you put a question about what we should, we, should we be more engaged in Latin America underneath, I'm betting the divide would be much less. It's, it's stunning. It really is. Um, uh, it's, and, 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 uh, and, and kind of a shame, actually. Um, with that, let me first of all thank the Chicago Council. What a great job you guys do. Really, they deserve a huge hand of applause. Thank you all for being here.